swaying a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, yeah. and welcome to the next Necromancy podcast. Today, we're discussing Lichdom, and we're here with It's a Ghost UK and Seventh Outpost. Hello there. Why, hello. So, I guess to start off with, it's as good a point as any, might be the motivations for Lichdom. What would cause someone to go and become a Lich? Um, because the flesh is weak and the bone is eternal. Yeah, for sure. I think it's 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 very obvious. It's like it's the fear of death, you know. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the uh, the very base of human. I wouldn't say the base of human action, but perhaps the base of of, of the action of every creature. You know, we're afraid mm. of death. We're afraid of the unknown. But so, just like, for... why not just make yourself eternal? Yeah, but like if we take a setting like Forgotten Realms, there's other paths to immortality. For example, a lot of wizards don't age. So I think the decision to come a, to become a lich is actually one about power more than anything else, because would you would you say would you say it's also to do with mortality as well? As in, because when when it comes to life, especially in sort of fantasy settings that would have liches mortality rate would be high and life expectancy would be kind of low you can't you can live to a long age but typically magic would be involved or if you're an elf or something along those lines so i can't yeah. help but think that especially when it comes to liches there is also got to be a desire to do stuff like maybe you can't move on maybe there's other things to do first it's stronger than standard immortality because of the phylactery the lich can be mm. killed and then he just respawns Pretty much. Well, a wizard, even if he doesn't age, he if you know if he's taken down, he's down. Yeah. And there's other bonuses. Also, they're kind of like bonuses and drawbacks. There's stuff like, you know, the lich has the aura of fear around it, at least in the Forgotten Realms. It's also got a touch that withers the living. So in that regard, you're basically sacrificing a lot of the ability to be around people. I think uh, one of the biggest things that is very consistent in many worlds that have lichdom is that uh, if, if you decide to become a lich, you forfeit all feeling. I mean, like all sensation. Drinking yeah. doesn't get you get you drunk. Um, you know, foods don't really taste as well. All of that is just a very big price to pay. It's also really awkward to clean yourself, because say for example you've got really dusty bones, trying to get into all of the nooks and crannies of your skeleton, like trying to get... Like, how, how do you clean your, your shoulder plates? Well, you could just have like a little bone dude standing there with a brush. I'm just picturing that, and it very quickly <laughs> ch uh, turns into something else. <laughs> Merge yourself in, d in detergent or something like that. Yeah. I I don't think they're going to care about cleaning themselves. I don't think know, so either. Two centuries in, you know. Which brings me to the next point. The psychological aspect of becoming a lich. Imagine the mindset of someone who is, first of all, willing to become an undead thing and watch themselves rot away. You know, every time they look into the mirror, they see a putrid corpse looking back. They see their hands decaying. There's like bits of flesh falling onto the floor wherever they go. I mean, that's going to leave some lasting negative psychological uh, consequences, I think. Mm. Like, it's really crazy when you think if that was happening to you, how you'd react to that. I suppose um, something that we can also look at would be Im immortality in general, because typically when you have stories about immortals or people that are immortal, like in terms of age and whatnot, that cannot die or they cannot die for aging, after so long, they become kind of detached from the rest of humanity, don't they? Like, because they're an immortal, the one thing that we all share in common uh, when it comes to life is that we are all mortal. We share in our mortality. Everyone will die eventually. And the mortal is out of that. They're not restricted. So would they even care? Because you can have, a, I mean, you can have a, a stories with good liches. You can have stories with evil liches. But when you've lived longer than as a, as a lich when you've lived longer than some civilizations have existed when you've researched everything when you've done everything when you've done everything you can think of what then do you do what is there at the end 
there's no point in making friendships with humans that are going to be dead in a split second for you because of old age. There, there's no point in interacting with the world because it moves on. I think this is why a lot of them are depicted as being insane to some extent. Mm. I think um, you can see that over time and patience with things like diabetes and uh, leprosy, although leprosy is probably way harder to find in the modern world, is that uh, the patient simply sort of becomes detached from their body over time. Uh, it's sort of, I mean, they, of course, not it. Uh, they, they sort of... Um, become used to it as more and more of their body uh, falls apart initially of course it's very traumatic but uh, human mind has ridiculous adaptive capabilities mm. yeah and um the other thing about liches and we kind of touched on it just then but they really are inhuman they're very alien everything that makes someone a human you know the the desire to love, the need to eat, the need to sleep, all these things are gone. Yeah. Mm. And like they're never tired, they're always in peak mental condition. Um, they're always alert. They're often said to be like really intelligent. So I think oh, yeah, you... because they're they're able to do it in the first place. So they'd spend a lifetime learning the learning how to do the ritual for them and then do it. Yep, and also they succeeded in the ritual. A lot of liches fail and end up dead. It's kind of it's kind of an interesting point that you never really hear about failed liches, do you? It's always liches that have succeeded. You never hear about the ones that have failed. It's you never hear about any of those in um, fantasy worlds or books or games or whatnot. It's like you, you never accept you never accept a quest to uh, along the lines of ah legendary adventure that can save the world countless times. I need you to do me a favor, for you see, there is a lich nearby. A lich? My god. Well, technically. You see, he kind of failed, so now he is kind of wandering around bumping into things. He's a bit detached. <laughs> we need you to go put him down because he's scaring the children. I can I actually think... think... Be... Yeah, go on. I can actually think of two examples of this in a game, and they're also my inspirations for becoming a, a lich, or, you know, like, what, what got me so interested in them. The first yeah, yeah. one is in Neverwinter Nights 2, Mask of the Betrayer. When you enter mm. the Shadow Realm, you will come across a corpse and there's like a, a Death Knight guarding it or something. It's been ages since I did the quest, so I'm a bit vague on it. But it's all about this um, failed lich. And yeah. the other thing is Oblivion Dark Brotherhood. There's a quest where you have to assassinate someone who's aspiring to be a lich. And there's like a number of ways you can do it. You can well, remove the phylactery from his person, which kills him. It's an hourglass. Or you can, you know, just kill him in a straight up fight. And I think those are the only two examples I've found of failed ditches, but they're both quite interesting. Mm. I feel like there should be significantly more warnings about dark magic in worlds and stories and games there should be um possible to find like lost laboratories with its owner you know turned literally inside out with their organs sticking out or something like that as they very violently failed another spell it should yeah. be way more common magic should be dangerous especially mm. magic like that especially one that makes you immortal otherwise everyone be do would be doing it especially one with no central reserve of knowledge because you look at like um fan uh, fantasy countries and kingdoms and whatnot they will have these great libraries they will have uh, academics they will like i mean take the empire from total war warhammer 2 for example they have the colleges of magic you know and they're able to teach and do all these different things when it comes to dark magic, depending on the kind of setting we're in, um, or the kind of world, every single person, more or less, except for a few exceptions that would probably be apprentices to a previously dead master or having found some kind of tome of ancient knowledge, they're starting from scratch. They're having to rediscover everything over and over and over again. And a lot of them will die because of that, because there's no thing that can aid them and everything is against them. There's a very high chance to, uh, to fail. That is how um, the, especially in the in the ancient times, how the 
uh, alchemists learned is because you can't really teach anyone alchemy for the sake of like what if you find someone who's like evil in some way you know yeah, yeah. So, or, or like is gonna sell you to the authorities for being uh, an alchemist and the oh, authorities is this, gonna you know is, catch you uh, historical yeah. alchemy yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. historically so yeah, yeah. Uh, so the alchemists would write their uh, knowledge in uh, books in a very metaphorical fashion in a very yeah. non-direct way and that way you know of course it it, it, it was called later her hermetic alchemy because it was tough for an outsider to get in and understand that see i've got i've got i've got a book on it it's really infuriating because it's not just the writings that they do they also do drawings as well so you'll have a sun and the sun's got a face on it and the sun's pointing towards the dragon the dragon's high on meth the dragon is also holding a chalice the chalice has some latin words on it you google the latin word the latin word means lol get wrecked and it <laughs> turns out the actual and it turns out the actual lesson was in the bottom left corner of the art and all of that was a red herring and the yeah. actual lesson and the actual lesson is uh, cook me uh, cook meh for, for five minutes straight at a temperature of 200 in the oven. It's ugh, it's so annoying, but it works. But another Guys. another part another part of that though is <sighs> they because they're keeping the secrets to themselves. When they die, there's no one to know the secret. So you've got this m weird mystical secret thing, and nobody could decipher it. By the way, guys, uh, so high for hentai has just arrived. Oh, nice! So he'll hello be there. there. Hello. Let me get here by him. Why? It's hello good. there. Basically, just woke up. <laughs> no problem. So we discussed a few things, but we're still fairly fresh into the podcast. All right. So just to kick off the conversation again, I don't know where we left off. You were just saying something, it's a ghost? Uh, yeah, I was saying about how alchemy is just really infuriating if you try to get into it. But um, to, to kind of like uh, go from alchemy back into lichdom and all of that, especially when it comes to dark magic, um, it is, you do you do have you do have dark magic that is, you know, it's hidden away or it's very sort of mystical and it's very metaphorical. So, you know, like the whole thing of uh, uh, where, you, where you open up like a book and it's very sort of... Um, the raven of the night must swallow the day at noon. <laughs> the flower, the the blood of the poppy, and and it goes on like that. And if it's, I can, it, I can understand it being like that if it was for a sp the specific purpose of being a secret or being code. Like maybe, you, for example, you've got a certain type of powerful dark wizard or a lich that wants to pass on their knowledge to select individuals. Like yeah, uh, intelligent like a... enough to understand things. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. It, and it was, it was. Um, to some degree that historically, I mean, there were basically references to gods, which were references to planets, which were references yep. to metals. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I've got that in my world, and oh, it's, it's such a foster clock. <laughs> By the way, guys. Coming real quick, real quick, back to the topic at hand, sure. which is what would it take for someone to be a lich? I think it stems mostly from fear, from fear of death. I think it's like if I was to to call a lich a metaphor for something, it's it's our fear of of death and our fear of passing, and it's being willing to sacrifice everything in order to escape that. I mm. think there's a bit more to it than just that because. Like, you could become a vampire, right? They're also immortal. Yeah. I feel like becoming a lich is just one way for you to... How do you say this? If there's a mission you know you can't fulfill in your current lifetime, or there's something you want to do beyond your current lifespan, you would have to become a lich. Becoming a vampire is something that just kind of brings yourself to, like, a whole new underworld. Like, like vampires are strangely enough, like, related to, like, their own, like, political underworld for some whatever hellish reason. Liches are just kind of like, we read, we necromance, and we're kind of alone. Yeah, they're definitely the yeah, um, option. Liches are a metaphor for an entirely different thing. They're more like, um, for the lack of a better word, those kind of recluse scientists, while uh, vampires are more like uh, false nobility type of deal, you know? 
Yeah. So when we look at the world, if it comes to metaphors, to allegories, liches are an, a certainly different thing than a vampire. Of course, you can become both in a logical setting, but not if you want to represent something in your story or wherever else. You're just giving me a horrible idea now. Just like in modern modern day, with with tons of un different undead in, and you've got the politicians are all vampire uh, are all vampires, and the ones shooting up schools are liches. <laughs> I feel like that's more or less, honestly, what's going on in certain fantasies. Mm. Yeah. They've definitely got, like, a kind of fuck-the-world bent to them. I mean, I can kind of understand it, to a degree. I mean, sure, like, curiosity curiosity can be dangerous, yes. And, you know, curiosity killed the cat, satisfaction brought it back, the fuck, you know. Um, and all of that. Yeah, I feel like when, I feel like when it comes to delicious especially, it's more sort of there's not just a fear of, of like becoming a lich, but there's also the fear of one of somebody else becoming one. I mean, when it comes when it comes to all the sh all the stuff that they can do, there isn't a reasonable amount of things to fear with them. But I can't help but think, especially when it comes to a lot of the reasons to kill a lich, a lot of it is down to religious reasons or so on and so forth. Do we ever actually see kind of like fan uh, fantasy settings that? have a intense hatred for liches in a more kind of ethical moral sense so uh, something along the lines of um you've you've risen my great grandmother mildred from her from her sleep and now she's cooking biscuits it's time to die stuff like that instead of my god doesn't like you be gone bang not really like most of the motivations are like you know paladins and worship of whatever they're hunting yeah. the undead and they just hate them for that reason it's not just that. I think it's also because, like, the, um... I forgot that there's a proper term. This is probably not, but it's, like, the Zasso theory. If there's a chance for them to turn evil or a chance for them to, you know, use their uh, powers to basically, you know, just fuck everything over, then there is... There, there would just be, like, be hunted down for that simple fact. Because if they have the power to do it all by themselves without, like, any assistance, plus their mortality, there's, like, a really good chance they're just going to be hunted down for the simple fact that they can. Yeah, it doesn't it's mean like... they will... But it's just like, Hello there. it's like a I danger think, of potential. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That and I think that, um, I mean, we, we, of course, we have dozens of settings where a necromancer who can or doesn't have to be a lich, you know, raises villages and, and raises an army out of the corpses he slays, you know? So it's yeah. like, uh, that's more the, 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 necromancy department for uh common people taking revenge on him rather than a lich because you know we can probably expect a lich to be sitting in his lair you know tampering with the fabric of reality to keep himself alive longer i'm but just imagining I'd... i'm just imagining a lich there just knitting yeah yeah just, <laughs> just knitting you know doing their own thing you know yeah and and like along comes the paladin and kills him uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I think as opposed to, to, you know, necromancers who go out there, I think a, a necromancer who, who, or less a necromancer, a lich in itself, who isn't as much of a necromancer, I doubt would be that big of a deal, you know? Yeah. You know, a big mistake liches make, and I just thought of it then from what you said, is they advertise that they're a lich. Like, if a paladin's coming to kill you, right? Just let him think you're, like, some exactly. lesser undead. And then you get killed, the paladin thinks, Oh, my job's done here. And he fucks off back to his church. And then you just regenerate. Mm. I would also say, um, in a more philosophical sense, when it comes to sort of good versus evil, paladins versus legends kind of uh, dynamic, it's, it's one, it's overdone, but two, I can't help but think it's more of a kind of, um, especially when it comes to religion, and of course, everyone's free to disagree with uh, with this and, you know, do their own kind of opinions on it, but uh, a lot of religions in my mind, um, in my opinion, just kind of preach the notion of blind devotion, submission to the faith, all of that. It's, it's like you don't question it, you do it, and you are happy be happier in your ignorance because of that. And when it comes to liches, because of their curiosity, because of the knowledge that they're tampering with, because of all of... It's, it's kind of like the whole thing of, um, should humans be trusted with that kind of knowledge? It's that taboo. It's, it's tampering with mortality itself. 
should oh do we deserve do we have the ability to handle it should we be able to do it so i can't help but think that there is a very kind of um a restriction of knowledge because of that in the sense of you know it's you have one person who's who's happy but ignorant you've got another person who is who isn't like that who wants to kind of like go up and see how far they can get and do all these kinds of things that can I, that can be that can be quite scary can't it that can be I, yeah, that one d dude who doesn't believe in fairies in the room. Um, <laughs> in all honesty, I don't think liches are a metaphor for that in particular. Heretics, sure. Cultists, certainly. But I would say liches, there's something more fundamental about that. You know that there's dozens of um, even animal species who bury their dead. Uh, mm. There's elephants who have graveyards for their yeah. dead. There's this, and it's not just for the for the notion of like decay, you know, and 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 corpses if left alone causing disease. Uh, there's also some seemingly a, a form of veneration, as though there is some degree of of inherent belief. In, in some sort of continuation of, of life, etc., some, some something like that, amongst many cultures, in all honesty, uh, both human and, you know, well, we don't know why the animals do it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's ingrained in them. But I, I, I think that uh, a lich touches more on that than on being a heretic. I, I think a lich is like, uh, breaks the barrier between you know life and death in a very um fundamental manner it's one of like thing. a sin is blasphemy in this way yeah one other thing regarding motivations for becoming a lich and it kind of relates to what you're saying about breaking the cycle is like i think a lot of them become liches to escape judgment like if we take the forgotten realms for example the worshippers worship their god or whatever then they yeah. die, and then they go off to, you know, their heaven or whatever. Well, the Lich says he sort of breaks all that. He kind of, like, escapes that cycle of normality. I see. And it's kind Pure of like... Death. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a fuck you to the gods as well. I don't think many gods would like them for that reason. Mm. Precisely, precisely. They're, they're borderline afraid of death, hence and, and everything that comes with it, hence why lichdom yeah do you reckon do you reckon that the fear of death is a universal uh common amongst all of the amongst all of the different liches because i can't help but think that you're gonna have a couple people that do it not because of fear but because like maybe they've they've done so much i mean um yeah for take, sure take, i mean take take the tomb kings for example so it's like they they died and they were they the whole thing was oh yeah my my guys in the mortuary club, how about you do me a solid and after I'm dead you you bring me back and make me a god how does that sound boyos and the court's like you got it Cetera, my guy I'll sort you out so then they bring him back and he's dead and he's a little bit miffed about it to to say the least but I mean especially when it comes to the tomb kings the a big thing about them isn't really them being dead it's it's more the case of that the undeath isn't a it is a fundamental part of them and it is not it's not it's something that some of them are in denial about it's some of them that uh, it's something that some of them are kind of um they are they are dealing with but they are still acting as if they're alive yeah um so high for hentai touched on that a bit earlier when he said you know people could become liches because they need more time to achieve their their goals yeah, yeah. and a lot of rituals span centuries like for example do you know who Saz Tam is? No. He's the he's the Zolkir of necromancy in Thay, and Thay is um, an Eastern majocracy in the Forgotten Realms, and mm. um, so every Zolkir is for a different school of magic, and he's the, the the one for necromancy, and basically, through some civil war spoilers here, um, he manages to become like the chief Zolkir and then he constructs these gigantic um, fortresses and I've forgotten the name of them but there's like five of them and they're kind of like donut shaped things and everyone just thinks oh he's just you know 
fortifying these areas. But the way these things are placed on the continent is actually a gigantic ritual. And um, you no, know, this, this spans centuries. And all of this is to some insane end, like killing everyone on, on the face of the earth or something like that, some big thing. Mm. Oh, and by the way, if you want to read about that, that is in the Unclean, Undead, and Unholy books for the Forgotten Realms. Oh, really nice. good books. Um, so, the, so the purpose of these big donuts is to kill everyone, right? I don't remember the exact goal of them, but it's something like that. What is the purpose behind that for the character? It's so that he can basically... He's like a necromancer, right? He's got control yeah. over undead. If he kills everyone, then they're all loyal to him. Like, in a direct kind of way. I'm just thinking of the logistics of it, because it's it's killing everyone is one thing, but is he going to be going to every single place and spending with any just like going, boop, 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 okay, you guys are resurrected. All right, five billion more to go. That yeah. could just be a place out for him. Yeah. Right here. What is the point of that, though? Like, like, you kill everyone, and there's literally not... Like, what's there left to do? Well, like, seriously. Nagash wants the same thing. The whole Tomb King thing came because of Nagash trying to do a ritual to kill everyone. And it kind of got interrupted halfway through and maybe backfired oh, yeah. a little. And yeah, got... it wasn't... Yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, um, the Tomb Kings were originally meant to be enslaved to Nagash, but because he got interrupted in his ritual or, or whatever, they kind of broke free and that's why they're independent. At least that's the understanding I have after reading the Nagash book. Mm. Um, I was, I was gonna say, wasn't it the case with Nagash that he did some uh, shady, uh, shady shit with, uh, with vampires slash, no. No, he did it with Dark Elves, didn't he? And then the vampires yeah. were became because of him. Then he was going to try and kill everyone. Then the Ratmen, the bloody Skaven, were, were, were like, you know what? We should get involved, but we're too cowardly. Cetra, my guy, have this big dagger. Well, thanks, my gut. Thanks, my dudes. I'm going to use this to go stab him in the back. Yeah, I can explain a little bit of that. Um, so basically, he learns the dark magics from some captured Dark Elves. And mm. he like he does this great thing where he he makes the illusion that he sacrificed them in honor of his dead father or something. But what he yeah. actually did is he put them away, and then he learned from them dark magic. And I think he was the inventor of necromancy. Like he he somehow figured it out. And then basically what happened is he started conquering everyone and kicking everyone's asses, and mm. the kings tried to stop him and they couldn't. Then somehow he got defeated. I think it was the Lamians coming east with firearms that did him in in the end. So then he's like crawling through the wilderness in this kind of like weakened form, and he comes across like a cave in the ground or something, and it's got these, uh, it's got that uh, warp stone in it. And he learns that if he eats the warp stone, then he can use its magic. And so he basically becomes a warp stone lich, like glowing and whatever. Yeah. And uh, that, of course, the rat men want the warp stone as well because they're all, you know, obsessed by it. And then they do like a giant underground war. And somehow the, the, the rat men give um, a dagger to someone, some guy, and he's able to stab Nagash and that breaks the ritual or, or whatever. But um, the vampire thing, that came from Arkhan and the Black. Basically, the whole time that Nagash was crawling around eating Warpstone and whatever, Arkhan and yeah. the Black had been taken to Lamia, where the Lamians were trying to learn how to become uh, immortal like Nagash and his followers. And basically, something happens, like, the King of Lamia poisons the Queen, and then Arkhan tries to save her, and somehow that causes her to become a vampire, and she becomes the first vampire. And that's Neferata, basically. Yeah, I remember a friend that explained to me about that one, and there was some, also some really shady stuff going on, such as vampire rape and all of that. Oh, yeah. So but... she kind of... Yeah, she kind of hates vampires, uh, understandably. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Wait, that's actually a really good point. What about vampire liches? I don't think you can be a lich and a vampire at the same time, because, um, you know, a vampire requires blood, right? Yeah. A lich does a, a vampire. A vampire is just mortality, but with extra steps, because in order to keep immortal, you have to drink blood, which is kind of like normal mortality, except you live longer. But whereas with normal mortality, if you don't, if you stop eating, you die. And with a vampire, if you stop drinking, you die. Yeah. I think in the um, mod that I checked out and basically explored everything in uh, Lichcraft, there is a way you became a, a vampire lich. But what this basically does is unlock a new uh, set of uh, uh, powers for you, and yeah, you have, it does. There is like a whole blood system. Uh, for what that mod does, basically, you cannot use potions of any kind for yourself. You have to get it from by taking from other people and uh, absorbing blood from other people. Okay. But it also just proves pretty useful in situa uh, certain situations, like you no, know, uh, you know, race specific spells uh, to vampire as well. And that's in Elder Scrolls, right? Itself. But um, that was from, yeah, that was in Morrowind, but I'm not entirely sure if that's lore specific or not. I haven't really heard anything inside of uh, El Diero Scrolls, like, officially, that is both a vampire and a lich. There are just usually two subsets of undead. That's just how this mod tried to incorporate them both. Yeah, like, I think part of the reason you can't become a lich if you're a vampire is because... The ritual involves killing yourself, and a vampire is already dead. So, if the vampire yeah. was alive, then maybe it could work. And, but then the lich would definitely replace the vampirism. I feel yeah, like it, it, it's just like um, I mean, a lich doesn't need to eat anything. A vampire does. Why would you, in the first place, become you know a, a vampire? If you're a lich, or like you know, why why not choose lichdom over vampirism? It's definitely more powerful. Shit. I'm just thinking yeah. of like the perks and drawbacks, because when it comes to a lich, a lich can go out in the daytime, can go to Tesco, can go to Asda, can harass people, can jiggle to spooky, scary skeletons, and all of that. A vampire, though, it's pretty much stuck in um, copyright-free Transylvania, and it's eternal night, and there's also mist and smoke and all of that stuff everywhere. And the, tree, the trees have no leaves, and all the people speaking funny accents. The main advantage is you get to keep some humanity. Like, I'm pretty sure vampires have, like, the desire to have sex, and they they, they yeah. drink yeah. blood, so they've got that. They, uh, they... Castlevania does a very good portrayal on showing the humanity of them, especially with, uh, with Dracula at the very start. Yeah. Uh, before um, some stuff happened and his wife uh, was religiously challenged so the religiously challenged decided to challenge her on it and she failed to meet the challenge so then she got burnt yeah <laughs> the religiously challenged <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, was... <laughs> I guess I'm um... the religiously challenged because I'm an atheist uh, I'm a nihilist so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, something else, something else to say about a lich as well. It's you've got the whole thing with the fight like tree, but when you don't have a fight like tree, um, I mean, for, for my for my world, liches are a bit different in a sense wherein because magic takes a cost on the body, and it ranges from small side effects such as like uh, migraines, headaches, um, aching in the in you know. And it kind of extends, depending on how much magic you do, it kind of goes into stuff such as uh, organ failure, death as a medical condition, it's not very advised, blindness, paralysis, you know, your skin turning into butterflies flying away, normal stuff, normal stuff. But when you're a lich, you don't have any organs to fail, you don't have any eyes to blind, you have none of that, no skin, so instead it affects you mentally and drains from that. Um, and, th and that's why they have the whole thing with having a fire life tree, but they also need to make something else to take the toll of the stuff that they do. Would it be possible, do you reckon? I mean, when, when it comes to liches and stuff, usually they only have one fire life tree. Why is it that not a lot of them experiment with their new immortality? Because obviously they have an incentive not to, because if they mess up, they can die for good, again. But you, don't, you tend to find that a lot of them, they reach that certain point, and they just kind of stagnate. They no, they don't move on. They can learn. They can build. They can have empires. They can have armies. They can do what all of this. Can stuff. you? 
What, what can you do with infinite time? You know, it's you can do all kinds of stuff. It's it's very interesting. It's it's kind of like the whole thing with that um, one Reddit post we're in. Oh yeah, you're immortal now and you cannot die. Also, there's a snail that is constantly trying to kill you. <laughs> is it, you know which one I'm on about? No, I don't. Um, I, I touched upon this in in my own um, in the games I run and the world I am working on for them. I suppose uh, there is essentially the the first kind, which is a uh, sort of a race of, of lizard men after a fashion who crawled out of the sea, and um, it is they were essentially the first sapient race to 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 raise uh, into the world, and they're essentially all by now they're all liches because the only ones who have survived for you know thousands upon thousands of years to to survive through the fall of all the other civilizations including their own um have essentially adjusted to immortality after a fashion they live in towers um that exploit their race's knowledge about the very mechanics of the world. Their towers are uh, made uh, internally out of clockwork, of course. They're bigger, much bigger on the inside, and um, they're, you know, anything inside of them can be rearranged however they, they like, each atom, essentially, but none of it can be carried outside. Now, what's important about that is that they, uh, their whole thing was to give themselves over to a great ambitious idealistic pursuit um there was one lich who was trying to find a way into the future there was another lich who was trying to uh, produce a a machine or like, like a spell that could translate any language uh both those who are currently and those who would arise as new um new races emerge into sapiens um and you know all of them were basically lost in those thousand year old pursuits uh so i think that's probably kind of what what lichdom could be is like the time to give yourself over to a, a single pursuit you know somehow you know focus laser focus on a single thing and basically aim for the sky you know yeah, just and, lock yourself off in your lair and just try to do that. Another reason like why. Reason... Oh, sorry. Go on. Um, it's not. It's really not too important. But I, I feel like some liches just like when they first became a lich, or at least they might be like ones that are more battle oriented. Because once you become a lich, I feel like you have a lot more fun because you have a literal respawn button you can press any time. Yeah. Because like you usually hear about liches just like hiding in the lair, hiding in the lair. I get a feeling there's gonna be some liches who are just doing that. You won't know where the fuck their lair is because they're literally going around everywhere around the world, just doing their own thing or maybe just yeah. having fun. And that's just, like, that... yeah, sorry. Raiding. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just like just constant ra uh, raiding, like finding one village, killing them all, raising them, then going another, just like to potentially try to raid one city. They die. They learn how to fight against the new paladins, or like just slowly build up battle experience to just do even, do even more crazier shit. Yeah, um, it's ghost. You can go, but after you, I've got a point to make. Oh yeah, sure. Um, one thing, I, one thing I'm kind of like um, so high for hentai. That... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a problem? That's a great name. <clears throat> no, 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 no. Serious, 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 serious voice now. One thing that's so high for hentai has uh, given me in terms of ideas and whatnot. He raises a good point. You only ever really see liches like, yeah, you'll see them be doing dodgy shit uh, around the world, but you don't really actually see them leaving their, their little abodes and actually going out into the sun and doing stuff, do you? It's always the case where the hero has to go through this great big journey where they gain about 20 levels of experience, a, a mystical magical sword, and at least one female companion that they get with at the end of the book. Then they kill the lich after finding out his lair and going to his lair and doing all of his dodgy stuff and then killing him in his epic final confrontation where the guy literally just wanted to play Dwarf Wars just by himself. <laughs> and then and then it goes on from there. It's never, you never really kind of have the opposite. You never kind of have it as the case wherein um, a lich source of singing into the future going, by Jove, a hero is going to kill me? Not if I can kill that bastard first. It's like a trope. It's like zombies are always dumber than skeletons. It's something that's kind of dumb and people should probably do more with liches. 
Yeah, it's it's it's. I am the dark and evil overlord. I will now give you plenty of time to kill me. Be yeah. sure to take your own time. It's I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. oh. you never know who's gonna be the hero. That's really the point. It's like there's plenty of, of fuckers running around with swords all over the world, and you know only one of them becomes the chosen one, right? Yeah. That's why you kill everyone, because when you kill everyone, you kill everyone that they'd ever, ever make. And therefore, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my point I wanted to make, coming mm -hmm. back to what you were talking about, about why does the Lich just seem to do nothing a lot of the time, there could be a reason for that. And I think it's due to their incredible age and the way their perspective on time might change over that course. For example, you know when you're a kid, an hour seems like an eternity to you. Whereas yeah. like as an adult, it feels like almost nothing. Well, imagine if you're 10,000 years old, you might just sit there for a year daydreaming about some stupid thing like I don't know what, because your perspective is so screwed at that point. I don't know how, like we can't, we can only speculate, but maybe liches would be quite slow, a bit like ants. I feel like that could be a is like isn't like one legitimate goal for a lich just to out every other hero yeah wait for them to eventually die then you do your own bullshit pretty much mm. um going along with that technically then because of that doesn't that necessarily mean that every single lich's lair is essentially a very bad old people's home <laughs> i mean it could be only one person is there, and that person is- well, actually no, technically everything in there is dead, so... Well, yeah, you know, it is an old people's home. You know, um, demi-liches, right? Yeah. Uh, that's... that's the skulls, isn't it? Yeah. The, the yeah. story behind them is, if I remember correctly, please fact check me, guys, in the comments. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> in the Forgotten Realms, right, a lich has to constantly put souls into his phylactery, to keep him sort of alive or sane or some shit. I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's got a bunch of soul every now and again. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how often it needs to happen. And I don't know, like, how um, frequently or whatever. But basically, if they don't do that, then they go insane or something and become a demi lich. And they're just, like, meant to be floating around in the cosmos doing crazy stuff like weird philosophy shit, they're meant to be like pretty insane. And that might be something interesting to talk about. I've got this very stupid image now. You've got a demi <laughs> you've got a demi lich floating in the infinite cosmos. You've got this demi lich going around this abstract reality between realms. Goes up to this ancient, eldritch, Lovecraftian entity that's something incomprehensible to mortal minds. Yeah. And can only be described in the abstract with maybe a couple of limbs here and there and eyeballs and shit. And the demon says to him, Great I ask of you, what is the true philosophy in life? And the and the Eldritch creature turns to him and then goes, Seize the means of production. Oh. Max. Destroy the capitalists. Make sure <laughs> communism prevails. <laughs> Well, um, that, that would be that would be a very evil entity in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, I forgot oh, what okay. I was gonna say. It's like He's... starvation is the way, kids. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say that Demi Lich would would have uh, at that point marked everyone to death. Oh, I remember what I was gonna say. A Demi Lich is basically like the the guy on mushrooms of the necromancy world, pretty much. Like yes, just, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Just a complete stoner or something. That's actually a really good point. Can liches actually use drugs? They can't imbibe alcohol, they can't snort or smoke stuff. Like, surely they can have some kind of magical, spiritual... Like, if they were to take a soul and condense it, and, like, get a, a razor blade and, like, sort of, like, do soul lines, could they then in inhale that or... Well, rub it onto their bones oh, or something, and that's, then... That's a good point. Uh, what if they, like, if they, let's say, you know, take life from somebody, uh, kind of Dementor-style, you, you know, that sort of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was you know, giving out the good sort. Yeah, and, and they go through through all of the experience of the soul. They've just, just snorted. What if they, like, take a junkie, you know, and like, snort him full of cocaine. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> That's, That's <laughs> <really> horrible. 
Well, there's wait, actually wait, wait, yeah. There's actually one way that a lich might be able to get high without taking any substances, and it's basically, you know how people who meditate can achieve some kind of high just by yeah. meditating, and it's supposed yeah, to it be is. Very, yeah true. It's supposed to be as powerful as LSD. So, I mean, I'm not lich... sure about that. Actually, but... wait a minute, wait a minute. I feel like we're getting one, we're getting one thing. This is a fantasy world with spells. Couldn't you just do some like weird, fucky, wucky illusion spell on himself, and that'll give yeah. him his own kind of high? Yeah, and he could also uh, <laughs> use like a transmutation spell to transmute into like something that can experience all this stuff. Unless you're a necro druid, and you can just literally turn yourself into a tree and. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, it's gonna be an I undead not... tree, so. I was, I was gonna say, I was gonna say for the for the drug swing with liches. What if you have a lich that is so old and so ancient, so detached from reality that the only way that they can actually feel anything, the only way that they can actually experience and feel and love, and the only thing that, that actually makes them feel alive, despite their death, is to just snort the memories of other people, like. And live the and live these people's lives. They could probably do that without snorting. They could probably um, just you know do some kind of weird. Or I mean, like you know, like uh, like take their place almost, or just like, I mean, just the you know, fourth font of it. Not not yeah, it's, it's like the memories, as in as in sort of go inside the heads of these people, like like maybe kind of like mind flare, crack open a cold one with the boys, like open some heads and have like finger the brains and whatnot. And you kind of like the lich then sort of mentally lives through the entire life of this person, spending 20, 30, 60 years just in complete stasis by themselves, just completely high on, on this person's life, just going through it memory by memory, experiencing everything, feeling Reliving, everything. Yeah, reliving, and then, reliving the stuff that's that he likes, you know, yeah, yeah. snorting then, randomness ashes to, to get her, you know, to get high. Yeah. Her. And then, and then by the end of it, when it's all over, the lich kind of like wakes up, sees this still a, still a skeleton, this overwhelming coldness and nothingness overtakes them, and then they're just there going, oh, oh. I no. mean, all of this comes back to the psychological aspect of a lich. Like, what, what would a thing that, you know, can't love, can't eat, can't sleep, something that's so inhuman, what would it, what would it even desire to experience those things? Um, that's a really good point. I mean, I feel like when it comes to humanity, we are more than just sort of um, feeling love, feeling this, feeling that. It's humanity in my mind is the ever striving goal of achieving perfection, re but realizing you will never ever achieve it. Humanity is, is a being a flawed creature of a flawed biology, of a flawed design, and flawed mind, and working with what you have to to do your best. Yeah. Like, Guys, quick note: it, we have we are one hour in. We haven't even mentioned Laz or Philanthropy. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, to bring out more of the Philanthropy thing, I'm trying to think. I'm not entirely sure, or at least I feel like you can modify it in some sort of way because back in like D and D two E, although these guys weren't really um actually yeah they're kind of mentioned here the most. Uh, I'm not really uh, I didn't really see or hear anything about. Archliches uh, requiring souls for the far left three. Archliches, by the way, are basically they were they are good liches uh, through like a whole process. Of, uh, they would be uh, just like good wizards or like anything like that. Just became a lich, but just an archlich instead. They didn't really need any souls to sustain themselves, but they are far and few because you know it's basically they are taking like an important practice, making it a bit prettier, but still you know still on death. Yeah. So basic. So basically, an, an archlich is essentially that next year's iPhone that can run, say, Fortnite or something along those lines. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, very similar like, to the archlich is the Bale Norn. You know about that? Absolutely not. It's, no. That, that, that's, oh, isn't that like the um, like the Elven version of that? Yeah, it is. Basically, I don't know what society it was in the Forgotten Realms, but there were a kind of elves. And then basically, it's, it'll be Dro. It'll be Dro. It'll always be Dro. Always. <laughs> no, it was actually like good elves this time because the Bale Norn oh. is meant to be good. But anyway, yeah, so it, archers are basically required to be, uh, to be good creatures. There is, it, it cannot be anything below good. I was going to say the only good elf is a dead elf, but if you've got a lich elf, they're essentially. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, anyway, yeah. this, this uh, yeah, that Norn, certainly sounds like a good elf. <laughs> they sacrifice themselves to uh, protect the the people forever, basically. They become like guardians. Anyway, mm -hmm. please continue. Um, so yeah, like, those, those, those guys. Um, but also, I feel like there's, like, still, like, there's also, like, other ways to experiment with the file actually, because, like, um, it's, like, going, like, a weird side note, not really touching, well, it's not really touching, like, normal, uh, standards, like, stuff, um, in Harry Potter, uh, the way how Voldemort just keep on, re like, keep on respawning more and more is because, basically, uh, he split his soul into multiple pieces and made yeah, them yeah. into Horcruxes, attaching them to items. Horcruxes, exactly. Perfect. And then he, and just just you know doing all that kind of shit so it makes me always think can a lich just like split his soul with different pieces make multiple fucking phylacteries just place them all the world so he can just like respawn at a point like certain places or just you know have yeah. multiple phylacteries just do. very cool mm -hmm. well yeah. if you put what well, if you put well if you have make a cat into your phylactery you put the cat in a box with poison and then you have schrodinger's phylactery because <laughs> you're both alive and dead at the same time <laughs> so no nobody can do anything oh, to God. you yeah Holy shit. Well, they can just open the box and... <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's- okay, there's one floor in the plan. <laughs> <laughs> you know There's only one floor. I was trying to think, what is the first lich in fiction? And I think the first one is probably Sauron, right? Uh... Um, I think you can- you can go backward from that, even. I mean, uh, Tolkien wrote in what, um... You know, around the war... Uh, you can ha you can ha certainly have stories in eighteen hundreds that could probably be like roped into that. Do you have any nice. examples? I know I know that a lot of his stuff was based on myths and legends and whatnot around the world that he then drew upon and did stuff with, and then he became the the big the biggest granddaddy of fantasy. Yeah. Um, I think wasn't this just more popularized thanks to D and D. It was for sure. Yeah. Usually, yeah. yeah. Sauron and, isn't yeah. really a lich, but he does have a phylactery. The ring is that. Um, sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Except speaking of phylacteries, speaking of phylacteries, you will have to bear with me on this one. Probably okay. so high, uh, we'll know what I'm talking about. I'm clenching right. my victory in in anticipation. <laughs> Please go yeah, on. Yeah, you you should clench it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know how. Probably none of you have seen this besides so high, but you, there's this show called Madoka Magica. It's about. Um... Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Uh, it's about. It's no, no, about. I uh... I... Go on. Sorry, I haven't actually seen the show yet. It's on my watch list. But although you have to understand, like as a weeb, there is a lot of shit in your watch list. Overall, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's okay. Oh, Joe, uh, so high for friend... hentai as a weeb. Who would have it's, it's not the. It's not the thing. It's <laughs> not the thing. Either way, what, what, why I'm bringing this, basically it has magical girls that make, um, make basically demonic pact with a space ferret, and see <laughs> their souls. <laughs> their their souls are put inside phylacteries, essentially. They're put inside those necklaces and they're like, hey, um, he, your soul is put inside this necklace so you, your body can take more punishment. It's like... Hey, that's that's cool. Are oh, you sure uh, this but, is an anime and not anything else? When's no, the it's ferret an anime, coming? And it's it, it is an anime. No, no, it is an anime. But but let me let me continue with this. Either way, uh, this very fun, interesting mechanics to that phylactery, you know, uh, because if it goes away from their body, if they throw it away or leave it, their body goes limp. You know, no soul in it. Not nothing. I mean, there's no soul in it. So there's nothing animating it. So. Their phylacteries have to be closed. Second thing, they can use some form of magic, usually, you know, specific to themselves. But the thing is, the more magic they use, the more kind of filth they accumulate in this phylactery somehow. And uh, at a certain point, when there's enough filth accumulated in it, um, the phylactery bursts and they basically become demons. Uh, after a fashion, they, they 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 become abominations of some kind. But wait, which is basically is what they're called. But they they're essentially abominations. Uh, and long story short, I think this is all of those are quite interesting mechanics for for a phylactery. You know, uh, like having to keep it close, um, it getting dirty 
or you know filthy from uh, from casting magic it works into the theme of magic being dangerous and you know by the time it bursts you become something very very dangerous and very very not on um, not like what you were before it for sure is interesting but if if i had to do some weird shit for space ferret i don't think i'd want to become a lich i mean to be fair That's i think probably that true out of all of it, if a space fairy came to me and says, you're my guy, I've got stuff for you, I think I would just look at it, I would just start feeding my, myself and going, <laughs> how many mushrooms did I eat? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean that that's true, but you're not a teenage girl, so... That is so, a very good point. That is a very good point, I think. And I'm not Japanese, and my eyes aren't at least half the size of my head. Precisely, precisely. So, Wait, like, you know... aren't? <laughs> Wait a minute. Am I alien? It? Maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm British. We don't have that. We have gills because of all the rain. Oh. Uh, uh. Yeah. It's 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 we, we 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 breathe on the water and all of that. You know, so that's where we get the tea. Um, when it comes to phylacteries, like with having multiple wands with the uh, bod wands and all of that, why can like usually um a phylactery is the remains of the lich. Why can't the lich sort of I don't worry it. You can destroy the remains of the lich, right? You can. Oh yeah, it is a space ferret. Uh, <laughs> you can destroy. The remains... Yep. You can... <laughs> it's literally a space ferret. <laughs> he wasn't joking. You can destroy the remains of of the of the of the lich in the phylactery. Why can you not take little bits and pieces out of it and put them in different stuff? Like, oh yeah, oh so it's, it's you've got your heart, your intestines, your stomach, all of that shriveled up and in this box. I'm going to put my heart in another box, I'm going to make my intestines, and I'm going to melt them down and make a new iPhone with it. And, mm -hmm. and, and that iPhone's going to be given to somebody who never who, who never cleans out their house and they're a hoarder. So good luck well, getting that from good, The from thing them. is, it's, it's not always organs. It's usually like the phylactery is some kind of object, like a ring or an hourglass or something. Yeah. It doesn't have it's to be the just organs. Basically, yeah, just basically something made to catch their soul once their bodies disperse. It's it, it it can just have a wide fucking range. Imagine, oh god! Imagine if the twist all along is that the hero who's going to kill the lich is actually the phylactery all along. Harry Potter? God, yeah. is he also Harry Potter himself? Uh, I could have sworn. Now. Except okay, except this is done through intelligent design and not through accident because a guy because a creepy Michael Jackson knockoff with a wand wanted to kill a child instead uh, by by pointing a wand at it and saying. <laughs> Instead of instead of doing the reasonable thing and throttling it or dropping it or drop kicking it or even poking it or it's a baby you could say mean things to it and it would die like there's no you know the the whole idea of having a living creature as your phylactery is really interesting in terms of plot very interesting indeed but it's also kind of dumb because a lich that lives for millennia investing so much effort into some living thing that's going to die in a matter of decades. Well, actually, wait a minute. Mm. I just thought of something. What if you like it's still like attached them, like like it's still attached to their body, like their bones. If, if like you were wanted to be like a really fucking evil lich, you could make your like phylactery. Maybe like how do I describe? How do I say this? Like the um, the Grand Master Paladin. I don't know how, but you somehow did it. You you attached your um, you of uh, your soul to his body and just made his body your fucking phylactery. Because like he, you know, he does usual stuff. Eventually dies. He's put into like a special coffin. And some, I don't know, was some weird ass place made by paladins. That is gonna be like really goddamn hard and confusing for people to figure out where your phylactery is. Like, where's this phylactery? It's not on his lair, it's not around here. Where the hell is it? In reality, it's like miles underground, very deep, underneath their own fucking church, attached to bones of the old Grand Master of like the, like, what, like 9th century. Yeah. Just really just outthinking them doing that. Guys, how about, um, the instead of a person a li living person a bloodline becoming your yeah i was, I was just thinking that like what if what yeah. if you have a lich like i mean you've got isn't there that one character in soul eater like kind of uh, lives through his descendants or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. So, so something like that oh, yeah um, and, and... after a fashion uh, let me finish that one what about some kind of a house making a pact with either their head or some kind of a god this way you know it's yeah. like 
It's like, you know, that they become your phylactery and, and your enemy would have to literally kill every last one of them in order to stop you. I, I was thinking... I was thinking, along, you know how you've got the whole philosophical thing of the lich forsaking the humanity because they're going to be in this immortal skeleton that doesn't feel anything and is detached from everything and everyone and all of that. Well, if you had it where a lich went through, like, realized that, realized, hmm, you know, immortality is actually quite bloody boring. I can't really do much. Nothing interests me on the telly. I know what I can do. So what if he was to um, get his own family or, or sort of another family or whatnot and have it so that a someone becomes a phylactery with the yes. what's what's the word um cavite ca, 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 no. uh with with um <laughs> has this person become the phylactery with the with, with the thing <laughs> i can't remember the word breathe with the, man with the side effect, yes. hey, <laughs> with the side effect being that when the, when that person kills a lich or should the lich die, their soul takes over this person who's a phylactery, and the phylactery is then becomes somebody else. That person will live. That lich will live as a full living person until their death, wherein they will become a, a skeleton again with all of their knowledge and everything retained, and they get a second chance at life because they can live, they can feel, they can sire a new oh, generation. Wait. So what they, so then, so then they can continue it on. They could, you could have this one person single hand, well, single hand, technically single handedly, um, siring so many different bloodlines and being able to pick and choose between them as he wishes. You could even Literally have Literally Jinky's hand. Literally him. There is a, f a fiction that kind of does this, you know, Dragon Age Origins, right? Yeah, I've never really played that. It's the case, I know it's got fantastic cutscenes, but the gameplay itself is a bit... Hmm. I've played a bit, yeah. I just wish the fucking in Inquisition Nick Ramsey is just better. It's just like one main at most. And you can't even yeah. carry, uh, bring him out through a lot of things. Yeah, well anyway, this um, there's this witch in this uh, setting called Flemeth. And basically, one of the main companions you have in the first game, Dragon Age Origins, is... Uh, a witch called Morrigan and through her story spoilers she learns that her mother Flemeth intends to use her as her next body kind of thing and it it goes back in the centuries where Flemeth always has a daughter and then she possesses that daughter and um, the whole reason she doesn't do it immediately is because she lets the daughter grow up learn magic and do some stuff so that she can settle in more easily this is kind of like a kind of phylactery, isn't it? Maybe. I've just oh, you're just giving me a horrible joke now. <laughs> what if um, what if Flemeth, what if what if Flemeth has has a son? Well, says the narrator, very much like a very much like a Japanese couple that can only have one kid and wants a son instead of a daughter. There are methods behind that. Yeah, true. That it was never touched on if she has a son. <laughs> Weird. Try. I'm trying to think. I'm not sure if that would be classified as necromancy because, like, you have a way of continuing living after death, but that's just kind of like, I would just say it's more of like a technique of immortality rather than like lichdom itself because lichdom is, uh, yeah, in, in a lot of context, it's, it, it reaches like a new height. Once you become, once you become a lich, like in like, uh, including lichcraft, it says that as a lich, you are much closer to the threads of magicka. Like becoming a lich, it does not only just give you uh, granting you abil uh, abilities, you know, of just you know immortality and able to just retain all of your knowledge. It also just like gives you a powerful buff right at the start. She's just kind of like she's still mortal. She's just found a way of continue living after death, yeah. more or less. Yeah, I oh, agree I, with I, that. I found the word now. Caveat. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Perfect. Oh, I also just. Re oh, sorry. Yeah, so I was just gonna say God fucking damn it, but it's, uh, go on. Uh, I also just uh, recall something. Um, in like other like uh, context with the phylactery, like uh, including the uh, Draco Lich, uh, for them mm -hmm. it acquires f uh, f uh, to find another corpse to like you know to like actually like uh, regenerate themselves. Uh, just like a, any corpse, usually uh, best be uh, bet being like a dragon's bones. But that makes me think, like, like the f the. 
the Fall Guys 3 itself is just catching the legit soul. There's no real reason set in stone for him to always come back as the same body. What if he could just like be able to like possess some other body nearby or just actually change his uh, anatomy altogether since he has... He, I feel like he just do, uh, become like the fucking Iron Man of Lichdom. You just know kind what, of choosing you... your own kind of body. Oh god damn it! you've just... Oh, this would You're... be a perfect... This would be perfect for a comical anime where you've got it where the Dark Lord has been... Like the Dark Evil Lich has been killed and he comes back as a cute bunny rabbit and... And he stay and he stays with he stays with the main hero while the hero goes out on their adventures and the two of them have like this frenemy dynamic that and they grow oh. to, uh, yeah it could I could actually be no. very good storytelling. I was about to say that just sounds like it would be, like turn to rom com because for some reason if the a villain hangs up the hero they fall in love eventually. It's a fucking thing. <laughs> I don't I don't I, I don't love you, Baka. How, how could I? You you stuck your big meaty sword through me not five <laughs> years ago. I mean, if, if it's like what's it called? If the devil is a part timer, if the hero can get a crush on the on the devil himself, uh, also he has a literally committed mass genocide in the original world, then being Isekai, then she falls in love with him. I think anything can fucking happen. Happen. As long as it's not like when it comes when it comes to that stuff. As long as it's not to the to the degree of Sword Art Online where it. <sighs> I'm fine with it. I'm fine Where with do we it. have to really, you know, go all the way into anime after I rose that point? What about, you know, um, what about layers? Uh, it's oh, yeah. it's uh, one I mean... hour, 13 minutes. We haven't raised a single point about layers. Well, yeah. we, it's, could... I'll, I'll... we could do one of two things. We can either start talking about layers now and go for another hour, or we can continue Split. talking about yeah. liches for half an hour then stop and then do layers next week or whatever let's do layers next week i think that's an another point yeah. entirely yeah i think I, I, think, I mean you're the one that's going to be editing and uploading this so i think for you for, for you it's better to yeah 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 all right then let's, let's kind of start to finish by talking about yes. what our favorite liches and fiction are and you know examples in games and whatever uh, Ugo's, I, I say Seventh goes first and then we do it like uh, sure. top down. Yep, okay. Seventh, you're up. Oh, what the you're hell? You're in this spotlight. My Go favorite. out, sacrifice. <laughs> My favorite liches in fiction. I guess, um, with the interesting mechanics, I would say that Voldemort was. A, a a interesting lich to say the least mm. yep. yeah for sure yeah um anything else i honestly don't have a list ready you, you guys keep mm. going all right i've got a fairly extensive list just in my own noggin but i'd have to say that my favorite kind of necromancy uh sorry lich them if i have to choose like a setting would definitely be forgotten realms I think it's fleshed it out really well, and it's quite an interesting system that they have going on there. Following that, I'd probably go for the Elder Scrolls. Um, my favorite lich from uh, the Forgotten Realms is... It's either going to be Larlock, or it's going to be Saztam, and I lean towards Saztam, actually, because he's a bit more interesting than Larlock, simply because I've read books about him, yeah. you know, with his giant ritual and all that. Um, but there's heaps of interesting liches in that setting. As for the Elder Scrolls, I would say it definitely had a big impact on me learning to love lichdom so much. You've got so many quests in, in the Elder Scrolls, just in Oblivion really. You've got the Benarus Manor quest where you buy that haunted house Nanville and you discover that there's like a lich in like the basement and you have to kill him but there's the whole, you know, story behind that guy and his like quest for lichdom which was really interesting then you've got the uh brotherhood uh dark brotherhood quest where you've got to assassinate that guy who's trying to become a lich those two things got me really interested in lichdom um what else neverwinter nights 2 for sure with that quest i mentioned before how you go into the shadow plane you find the failed lich i found that really interesting got me thinking about liches a lot yeah, I think that probably sums it up. There's surely other things you could go for Nagash, of course. That's awesome. But yeah, I think I'll end with that. 
Um, I'm, I'm up now, am I? You're now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, ooh, I think I really want to say Kel for that, but compared to a lot of other liches, um, I feel like there's a lot more of a storytelling focus on other liches and what they can do and whatnot. And Kilpazad is a lot is more of a corruption story wherein you know his uh, curiosity gets the better of him, so he goes and does all of this stuff, and then he becomes a lich. And yeah, um, definitely, I'd say he's very he's a very good lich character, but there's not a lot of emphasis on him specifically. Like you fight him and you can talk to him and well, fight, yeah, fight him and hit, listen to him and all of that, but you can't. Can't exactly see inside his head like you can with other characters. Um, I'd say another good one, like one of my personal favorites, is gonna be the Dark Bishop from, and the Liches from Dragon's Dogma, uh, Dark Risen, the, the the game. The Dark Bishop is essentially a well, it's a bishop with a cardinal hat. Oh yeah, yeah, and and Kelfazad has a pet cat, so he's definitely really good. Um, but yeah, uh, with, uh, with 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 the Dark Bishop. He's essentially been corrupted. He's got he's got one of those Pope hats on, um, as you do. And uh, there's an interesting mechanic with him. He's at where, despite him being an undead with an undead cursed uh, cursed dragon, uh, that he actually works as his phylactery during the boss fight that you have to that you have to beat up. Um, he's actually weak to dark magic, and it's more the uh, I feel like that's more the case where he's not fully aware of the situation he's in and thinks everything else is corrupted and he's got to sort of kill everything else and all of that which which is quite interesting another one i'd have to say i really want to say i really want to say my own like there's a character i've got that's that's a lich and i really want to say that i'm not going to because that's just really kind of narcissistic of me <laughs> and selfish no well, let's 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 not do that one what if i'm interested to hear it fair enough <laughs> um Mortu's fight, Mortu's Phylon is. I, I do, I do quite like him as a character. It's the case where he becomes one. It becomes, it becomes a lich eventually, but it's more accidental than experimental. He's kind of like the first one, and there's a lot of risks involved. And he go, it goes from a character that gets, um, it goes from a character that wants to get revenge after stuff that has happened to him, to realizing the extent of his own actions and wanting to right wrongs in raising the orphans he had inadvertently made and therefore raising the next generation of necromancers and people that do necromancy in all their different ways so you have that he does and he does die in the end so uh, through self uh, selflessly to save others um which can kind of sort of you know had more of a kind of good uh, good story and good characterization to a typically evil and immoral thing um so you have all of so you have all of that I'm trying to think of. I, mean, I really want to say Irons from Overlord because you've got the whole aspect where because he's he become he goes from human to being over uh, an Overlord and he's got that whole thing of his emotions being suppressed and and all of that, um, which you can see kind of like through the books, wherein as time goes on he becomes more and more inhuman, he feels less and less, and so on and so forth. I'm trying to think of what else there is, because there are there are other good liches. Voldemort is definitely. What about Arthas? Is he one? Uh, no, no. He's, what about... he, he is called he is called the Lich King, but it's more the case where the thing in his helmet is basically an orc that um, did a bunch of magical fucky wucky stuff and split apart a planet because of uh, radical climate change with okay. with with demon stuff. And his sword has a bunch of souls in, which I think makes it stronger. But Arthas, like Arthas himself, Blizzard has really kind of bugged it up when it comes to Arthas because you, at one point you got Jaina saying, "I can still feel him in there, reaching out." The only reason he's not destroyed the world is because the real Arthas has as as has been holding evil Arthas back. And then you actually go in and fight him, and that's not true at all. It's very c conflicting. It's, it's hard this... Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so, no, sorry. Uh, go on. Well, I'm, I'm, t I'm not entirely sure. I can remember the lore exactly. Isn't Arthas just like a vessel for like the actual power? Like, isn't like Arthas pretty, just pretty like, much. somebody? It, what, the, his whole thing was a corruption story. He, he had an absolutely fantastic corruption story, and this was and this was like uh, an absolutely amazing bit of storytelling from Blizzard. Um, it was the case wherein Arthas was a it was, it was a prince paladin type who went to go fight an evil. Um, Count, uh, Count Dracula kind of motherfucker. So he chased him up to uh, Greenland, wherein he found a magical sword. Yeah, where he found a magical sword with his uh, height, um, height-challenged friend, Dwarf, Muradin, 
got the sword, accidentally killed his friend or gave him amnesia, went out, the sword's, you know, took control of office and corrupted him and fast forward he's a deaf knight and he's killed his own men and all of that. Fast forward he's killed his own dad because he's now edgy. Fast forward and he kills Ufa, fast forward and he kills a ton of people and pisses off even more people. Fast forward and he puts on the crown of domination and then he becomes a Lich King. I'm not sure of the uh, like I'm sure there's gonna be Warcraft three fans who are going to correct this, but I'm pretty sure that the Absolutely. crown had a had a ancient orc inside of it. Yes, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that, that was, was Lich that was King cool. and like Arthas, uh, yeah, Arthas became a meat puppet for that orc inside of that crown. Um, either way, I came up with a thing. Um, if we're doing our own stories, then let me bring up uh, a game I ran recently. Where I suppose there was after a fashion a lich involved in it. Um, you see, there was a an ancient member of the first race, an ancient lizard man who has since uh, become a lich, and his goal was, as I had, uh, mentioned previously, to produce a translation spell, or like a transla translation. Um, tool that can translate uh, every language, including languages that would emerge over time. And essentially, essentially, um, what I did was when the players um, entered his lair, his tower, where he was essentially a god, uh, they found it empty. Uh, and as it turned out, he had, um, he had died a while ago. Uh, however, his soul had since, you know, gone the full circle, gone into the stars to become one of the stars and go through its cycle of, of, of understanding its own failings, etc. And then it descended onto the earth back to be reborn. And it just so happened that the weaves of fate have tangled themselves well enough uh, for one of them to have been indeed that lost soul. He had been prepared for this particular contingency, uh, and immediately the tower lit up, where from the outside it looked like some like a medieval or like a Rena <laughs> sorry, Renaissance clock tower. Within the the moment he and. I'm interested in your religion now. Um, the moment he entered, uh, the moment one of the players entered, just an old, old, old Russian man, Dmitri, uh, drunkard, ex, ex soldier, not really, not really much of a, of a, of a life left, you know, just about to hit retirement, enters the tower and learns that in inside his body is a soul of an ancient lich. Very, very powerful and very, very old. And he is essentially the king of this here tower and inside of it he is a god. He is offered uh, to return to his old place and after a bit of a... after a bit of a let's say pause he eventually agrees his uh, body is augmented uh, he is given new new youthful flesh uh, and and of course magical devices are installed to enhance his mental capacity to that of of, of the liches of old as his former body, body had been and um, he has a bit of an epiphany remembering everything that happened one when he was in, the, in this brief period of time when he was a man when time was not as dilated as it had been for him and speaks with his friends and he after a, a, a while when when there's stuff happening all, all, all around the tower the world changes he realizes that perhaps this endless pursuit of of some of some uh, ambitious goal is perhaps you know isolating yourself from everyone else uh and, and, and this and this pursuit that perhaps you're ne never going to reach at in the end is just not for him 
it's just my, just pointless, just mindless. So, in the end, he decides to scramble the tower, and instead of it, he gains three wishes, after which the tower is going to be entirely devastated. So he uses those to help his friends and rescue them from the pit of despair. Hmm. And uh, everything ends happily. He just opens up uh, a brewery and uh, drinks himself through the retirement. <laughs> sounds like, a, sounds a, like a pretty good end, actually. In yeah. a small necromantic commune. <laughs> All right. So, how do you like the story time? <laughs> That's good. But pretty good. So high for hentai still has to do his influences part. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying to think. There's not really anything like... um. There's no like real lich I really look up to. Like maybe a bit of like um Ainz will go in from Overlord. But the problem is is well, it's not my problem. The main reason is that's because I just like uh like necromancy and the overlords. That's just kinda my thing. Mm. And I'm I'm trying to make even like a class in D D just because I want to be able to play a bit as a necrotic overlord. It's not Ainz will go, but it's just kinda like my own weird machination, which is a bit of a clusterfuck at the current moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're on the hand with that, I don't mind helping you out. Um, if you could take, uh, if you could uh, take a look at me or like see what a current progress is, or and maybe even get, I don't know. Like, it, it, I'm just like um, I'm more or less in the creation phase of the class right now. Yeah, I yeah. haven't really touched numbers yet, but I think I'm mostly finished with the creation phase. It's been a good month. It's I'm terrible with numbers, but I'm good with ideas and whatnot. All right. One last uh, question, yeah, I, I... if you're finished. Yeah. Would you oh, well, guys? No, like... Oh, please continue. Yeah, sorry. It's like um, so yeah, just like overlords and lichdom. That's just kind of like my thing. I, I like Angel Gone. Yeah, he's definitely interesting. It's just like he does also like you know just explore the aspect of being someone who's now you know a lich and just slowly fading away. I would just say ultimately he's just neutral. He's just a guy trying to achieve his goals who really just, he really can't see anything. Because at that point, if you're immortal, all powerful, do you really see like anything aside from your old current kind of personal view? And like. That's just the like the one lich I can really name. Sauron uh, is definitely who I'd say is more or less like the ideal overlord, because he has just so much shit going on for him. Like mm -hmm. that's just like one of my. I'd say he's uh, my. Those two are just my ideal role models more or less. Uh, just Eins for having all this cool shit and Sauron being the intimidating motherfucker he is. Yeah, Sauron's pretty damn cool. Yeah, yes. I've got one more question. Well, two more really, but the first one is, would you become a lich? It depends on the situation. Yes and no. Yes, because I, I, if, if life proved a bit inconvenient and I wanted to get my writing stuff done and becoming a lich would do that, I would do it. But the problem is, though, is that if you do that, if I was to do it, would it affect my creativity and whatnot? Like, would it would it go from uh, the main character then sauntered over to the pub, getting shit faced along the way? Does it go from that into character did this, this happened, the end? It would kill your humanity, yeah. so it would have an impact. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in a fantasy world, maybe. In the real world, absolutely not. There's, I agree. You know, yeah. No, no, no thought about it. There's literally nothing a lich can do in here. What about what if what if somebody was to become a lich uh, because of somebody else? Like, say for example, you've got this powerful necromancer who wants their child to become a lich to ha make them into uh, an immortal. Yeah, because they because they love this person so much, and they're not really. It could it could be that they're sort of rushing and they're not realizing the full extent of the side effects or what or what would happen. So what if you have a story where you've got a lich trying to rediscover their humanity and trying to become human again and trying to you know like, would would, would they be self loathing? Would they be apologetic for their existence? All of that like like there's a lot you could do with it. There's a lot, there's a lot that can be done in terms of storytelling with a lich character. I think, yeah. I'm not entirely sure if I just like, just become a lich just for the fact of being. Lich, like if I have to choose, is like out of nowhere, magic comes to the modern world. I probably just go out a normal way. But if it's like in like in like more fantasy setting, and I've actually like like legitimate reasons to stay after death, then yeah, I just become a lich. But yeah, yeah it's just very like circumstantial. It's like if it's just, like if everything's normal out of nowhere, is like hey, you want to become a lich? It's like fuck no. What's the point? 
Yeah. But it's like, in a certain situation, it's just like um, if there's like a, like constant suing on uh, like demons coming out uh, coming out, and like you have to de like defend the place, and like there's limited like, there's a very short life expectancy. I say, yeah, why not? Because I'm not gonna lie to you, I feel like the only thing that can like in terms of like raw power, I feel like uh, like demons and their shit can just like challenge necromancy because necromancy, free raise bodies. While demons just kind of have an infinite spew a number spewing out. It's just kind of like a race between who can get more bodies uh, than the other person. Yeah. I think with, it, with demons, isn't it like a very sort of capitalist competition on who can get the most power? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, hey, struggle with that. It's, it's, it, <clears throat> it's like, hey kids, I've got this awesome deal. Do you want to sell your soul? <laughs> yeah, getting souls from other people that that kind of fucking works. Hmm. All right, I'll give and my take now, if you're finished. Sorry. No problem. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Basically, I think in this world, definitely not. I'm kind of with Seventh. Like, you know, existence gets hard. Just, I couldn't imagine being here forever. But uh, in a fantasy world, I would probably consider it for sure. Especially, I think, like, for me personally, Lichdom would be the path to me destroying everything. Like, that would be the, the method I'd choose, because, you know, I'd have an eternity to plan. My touch would be corrosive and destructive to the living. I'd be immune to all kinds of attacks, like, I wouldn't have to worry about poison. I wouldn't have to worry about um, disease. I wouldn't Suffocation, have to, drowning, yeah. mental control, charming. It's much more powerful than, say, vampirism, where... You can get staked through the heart, and you can possibly still be poisoned, depending on how how it works. And of course, you know, there's just such power to being able to respawn back at your phylactery if something happens to you. But yeah, it'd be my kind of like, okay, I've had enough of this world. It's time to fucking become a lich, raise an army, and destroy everything. That's when I'd become a lich. See, there's one thing I want to say to that. Um... Am I? Can I? Can I? Can I yeah, can sure. I say it? If I was to become a lich in this world, I feel like because uh, I've had this idea a few times and I've, I've thought of it a few times, is you, you look at the world today, you look at the state it's in and whatnot. Well, if you had the lich in charge of their own country, and with the sole purpose of having a developed, um, just a developed society, developed country, developed all of that. Good education, good healthcare, good um, career paths, just good technology, invention, medication, science, um, just all of that. Do you reckon it could be possible? From so, because when it comes when it comes to humans being in charge of countries, when it comes to um, democratically elected prime ministers or presidents or monarchs or um, tyrants or dictators or even like a small community of people that uh, control certain things or even an oligarchy or say companies that control the market or you have all of these different things but the key similarity between them all is is the human element because the human the a human being is flawed the human being will of course do stuff that will be illogical and can mess up and can cause problems for other people and when you're in that kind of position one mistake or one choice can impact a lot of people not just in your own country but in other countries as well so when you've got say for example a, a lich that is so detached from all of that that has this much knowledge that has this much time of, um that has this much opportunity would that therefore make for a better politician or therefore a better ruler than not... say a living person that that you know is going to be there for a limited time that would act in their own self-interest that would do stuff for stupid reasons. I don't think so because it would stagnate things. Like when you've I, oh got, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you've got new people getting born with new ideas, it helps move things along. If you had things that were just living forever, it'd kind of like break the process of evolution, right? It'd stall it. And you might find that there'd be no progress anymore. Perhaps we as a species grow, and we ch civilizations will change their culture. They will languages will change, culture will change, uh, things change, industries change. Yeah. Everything grows and adapts to the environment, to in re even response or to better suited and so on and so forth. Yeah, like imagine if you had like you know the the founding fathers who owned slaves, 
in command of yeah. modern America. That would be very strange. There'd be a complete disconnect from. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm trying to... Go on. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Didn't like Warhammer 40k, well, just like Warhammer in general, kind of do this? Like the Imperium men and their and their king. He's not. He's not a lich, but he's immortal, and he's just it's... trying to make them better. But they it's... fuck up. Yeah, that's the God Emperor of Mankind. It's, um, if you've watched uh, If the Emperor Has a Text-to-Speech Device, it, they kind of like go into explaining it. But basically, a bunch of shaman guys... I'm, I'm, I'm hoping somebody that knows a lot better than I do will explain it. But basically, what happened is he was there, and he decided to be on the sidelines for a long while. Then uh, some stuff on Earth happened, so he was like, you know what, I'm cutting in. So then he did some bunch of stuff on, on the moon made his space marines, took over uh, Earth, and then he decided he was going to make this great big spanning empire across the stars. The, the goal is to make more like him. He is the epitome of what humanity can be. He is what humanity can reach. And his goal was to make more like him. He was to, to have humans being the apex of... Like, like, to have humans being the... as high as they can go. Yeah? To show... To show to, yeah, to get them to that point. And then a bunch of stuff happened. He uh, made his favorite son uh, in charge of the Crusades while he was working on the secret project. Um, then, then his son turned edgy, started listening to Coldplay, went evil, um, decided to kind of do some dodgy stuff. Um, then half his sons turned against him, and there was like 18 of them, and they were all really like powerful demigods and whatnot. And that went about as well as you'd expect. And then his, and then his favorite um, guy, Sanguinius, died. And then the Emperor killed Horus, who was the main traitor. And then the Emperor suffered some really bad wounds in the process. So in order to basically keep the Imperium going, they kind of stuck him onto a big golden throne where he then kind of... It's, it's, it, there is a skeleton. And because he's not directly in charge of things anymore, the Imperium is going through this great big regression where tech where the advancement of new technology is heresy um technology in itself is faulty people don't know how to make new stuff so the stuff that they have currently is either old not working or people don't understand how to make new stuff of it so it's invaluable to them and humanity is splintered across the entire galaxy and whatnot and somehow is it's it's not it's managing to kind of survive in its death rows, but it is not thriving, and it will uh, fast forward, and it will kind of get to that point where it's going to be yeah. And because it's grim dark, everyone's really upset and suffering and dying, and <laughs> because it's grim dark, it's a very like it's because it's grim dark. All the heroes are not heroes, and even if you have a hero who does good stuff, he's still going to be um, killed in the race from history, and he's going to be branded a heretic by the end of it, so on and so forth. All right, one last question. And I think we should probably wrap it up because we're currently at one hour and 35, which is good. <laughs> anyway, yeah, good. Good. My, my final question is, we often do not see any um, female liches. What do you think about female liches? If you want to hear the part about female liches, you have to become a patron. The patrons get the uncut version. It's because some things were discussed that aren't so good for YouTube, potentially. I guess they've been going on long enough. We've got an hour and 44, 47 minutes on the clock. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Anything else we should say before we wrap it up? Um, what Should we mention the Lich in the Dragon's Dogma series? This, I mean, the series is, is all right. I, I, I'm not that happy with it. I'm, I'm, it's a bit, I'd say it's five out of 10, but I mean, that, that one Lich with the undead. You can, sure. We can stretch this out to two hours, why not? <laughs> so, Fuck it. so in yeah, so in one episode, because uh, uh, the series is like based on the Seven Deadly Sins, and they kind of do it poorly in my mind, because uh, there's so many, there's so many ways that you could do that the Seven Deadly Sins as a concept and as an idea, um, and and you know, you're talking but, about Dragon's Dogma. Or... Yeah, the series. That's uh, that's uh, based on the game. Yeah, the series is based on the game by Capcom. They also did an MMO, which. If you want to play, you can do, but um, there's going to be it's a lot. It's dead right now. Oh, oh. Well, this yeah, it's yep. oh. so I'm, I'm, I'm right, right on top of that. Um, uh, it's resurrected, but yeah. Uh, well, that's a bit. Uh, that's that's a bit unfortunate. Um, 
it was basically they got this lich and he was like a vicar priest whatever kitty fiddler um <laughs> uh, <laughs> um and he was very greedy as you do like taking some money on the side and whatnot and using religion to kind of like get them get them fat monies then he died then his greed brought him back as a lich and he's got a coin in his eye so that's how you know he's evil so oh. then he took it all of so then he took everything from all of the people because he was that bloody greedy so he took everyone's Fortnite accounts and uh, took everyone's full fortress progress in total war campaigns. So then he basically just kind of um, chilled in this underground chapel, as you do, with this great big massive hoard of gold, as you do. Um, and basically, he's only he only ever gets pissed off when people try to take his stuff, as you do. But when it came to the undead and that, they actually did some very good. Did some very interesting stuff with it because he was basically flinging and throwing around his undead uh, minions and skeletons and whatnot. Like he was basically throwing out like these balls of smoke, and you'd have like these skeletons that would come from it. So he'd be throwing out like this great big ball of smoke, and it would hit a wall, and then the skeleton would drop down, get up, and then start attacking you. So it kind of makes it feel more kind of dynamic and fluid than the simple point and go and then everything in, in that direction dies. And he does die in the end because his own greed gets the better of him and he t sees the sunlight because he's not seen sunlight in 5,000 years, he just dies. Oh. And, and also because the sunlight kills him dead. So it's kind of... Uh, who, who, did it for, who did it first, Capcom or Minecraft? No clue. I, I don't know. No clue. I'm pretty sure it was uh, Minecraft. But I may be wrong. And uh, Scottish Undead Wizard Dad raises a good point. The minions felt more like continuation, of, like a continuation of his being. So it's like they're a part of him, which you don't typically see um, in fantasy. Because usually it's like, uh, my guys, click, 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 point, go and kill that. <laughs> yeah. All right. I guess we've probably gone long enough. I'd just like yep. to say one last thing. We didn't talk too much about phylacteries, but that's okay. I've got an entire video dedicated to just that, and mm. you can go and watch that if you want to know more about uh, phylacteries. Any I'm closing? Still just... Sorry, go on. Nah, nah. I'm, I'm not sure if it's closing. It's like I'm still wondering possibilities if, like, if you could just make your body into anything because it's just your soul. What are the fucking circumstances you can do with your phylactery? Like, can you just like at one point just respawn as a giant? <laughs> You've never seen a giant lich before, have you? No, I haven't. That would be pretty fucking horrifying, wouldn't it? I mean, don't you see in D&D, like, really long campaigns that are ten years long, and it's like, oh yeah, we've got a terrace, and that's also a lich, vampire, a demigod from the uh. plane, from the plane of Neverfucker. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in D&D, any lich can just, you know, use a transformation spell to become a giant. So I mm. guess, if that counts... Um... I, d I, d I kind of want to give an example for a giant lich, but it doesn't really classify as a lich. It's more it's more in my world as a demon that tries to put his soul inside the body of this giant golden um, city-sized colossus. And it's, it's a case where it's that big, he can't control it. So his soul splits, basically. Um, what, so half his soul goes back to his body, and the other half stays within the construct, and uh, they become their own separate personalities. So you've got one that's a soulless king, and then you've got one that's a mindless city. Check out the interesting dynamic. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. All right, so, guys. I, mean, uh, yeah. I guess we should wrap right. it up now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks very much for taking part. It was great. We discussed so much. I've got a lot of things to think about now. I'm sure yeah, you do we too. Really, we really underestimated when we thought we could do both glitches <laughs> and layers in the same video. Yeah. Mm. There's not that much info on, on liches, but goddamn, can we get some <laughs> ideas? Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah, thanks for having us, Chib. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much for thank doing you. the podcast. Yep, I'll see uh, you on the fun. next one. Alright. See you all yep. again. See ya. Thank you everyone for, for watching and being here and, visit and listening and all of that. I hope you enjoyed that. Sorry about the lair. If you were interested to hear about lairs, don't worry. We'll cover that soon, but I get the feeling that most people who voted for Lichdom and Lairs were probably voting for Lichdom more than they were voting for Lairs. Anyway, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.